In the 2003 film, What a Girl Wants, Amanda Bynes stars as Daphne, an American teenager who travels to London in order to find her father, while we in the audience find her annoying. But she's not just irritating in the way that all Americans are after visiting Europe, it's worse. You see, Daphne is a quirky girl. She does things a little differently from other girls, such as sitting on counters, dancing at parties, and get this, sometimes she even falls down. <laughs> oh, Daphne. If a girl this clumsy shows up at my castle door saying she was my daughter, the first thing I would do is request a royal brain scan. So let's join this American woman as she bonds with her new British father and new British boyfriend, sometimes in uncomfortably similar ways, all while managing high society expectations and fighting against the closest thing to prejudice that someone in her position will ever experience. Heavy is the head that wears my frown in another royal installment of Clip Breakdown. Ah! Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content on the web and break it apart. Like we're dismantling Big Ben to clean all those little greasy gears, baby. So that we can look at each individual clip and say, why did we like this movie so much as kids? It's not good. Sorry to say, that's what I'm gonna be saying for this one today. What a Girl Wants starring Queen Amanda Bynes, who I love as an actress she's like always been one of my favorites and I had actually never seen this movie before so I'm excited to break it down with you but before we get into it make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more nostalgic early thousands breakdowns like this but most importantly if you're new to my channel I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here that way you never miss new videos from me I upload two new ones every week so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when we're retuning Big Ben I'm a clock repairsman also I have a merch available and a Patreon where you can access bonus episodes of Clip Breakdown and virtual watch parties with me every month. Once in a while, you know that a movie was meant for you within the first few seconds. I'm relating very strongly to this film just after seeing the very first studio logo. I think I've actually appeared in a Gaylord film once, but it was more for web content. It was a good shoot, you just had to watch your step because the floor was really slippery. I'm getting iconic, stunning visuals from, you know, frame number one with this movie. So we got off to a great start, but my friends, this movie is an hour and 47 minutes long. No movie needs to be that long. I don't care if you're telling me about the life of Christ. You can make that 15 minutes. He was born, he did the rock thing, he did the fish thing, he went to home. This one, they're like, let's give him a montage of him dying Easter eggs. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, what a girl wants. Oh yeah, I forgot the Lunesta butterfly went through a boho phase after she moved to New York. They meant to reserve some of the budget to make it look like the butterfly's wings were flapping, but then everyone voted to have an ice cream sundae bar at the wrap party instead. What would a movie be without narration to give you pointless information? I've lived my whole life with my mom in a fifth floor walk up in Chinatown, but every year on my birthday I'd make a wish that someone else could be there too. One thing I should have warned you about for this movie, they pretty much cannonball you into the deep end of a abandonment issues right off the bat. So if you like soft-spoken teens with sadness in their eyes, you've come to the right place. And every year when he didn't come, I'd ask my mom to tell me the same story. Once upon a time. No wonder this girl has an unhealthy obsession with her estranged father. She got it from her mama. Maybe Daphne wouldn't feel so strongly that she needs to meet her father if every year for her birthday she didn't get a magical fairy tale about how he left the family. Go off, I'm not a parent, so far be it for me to say. This all feels really sad similar to a movie we've seen in the past called Confessions of a Teenage Drama Queen, where it's like a lot of narration and a lot of stylized, fantastical flashbacks about the way the parents met. What kind of cliche is that? I want to sing that song from Annie so bad, but I won't. Or maybe he reads, maybe she sews, maybe she's made me a closet of clothes. Skeleton keys, Barbara and cheese, everybody has hairy leg knees. I don't know the rest of the words. <laughs> and his name was Henry. 
Ooh, she can already tell that he's rich based on the quality of that hairpiece. He said, let me just get a nice breathable all lace toupee for this desert excursion, mama. And we're married by the chief of a Bedouin tribe. That Bedouin chief is like, so are you both like joining the tribe now? No? This is just Disneyland for you? Okay. Troubles a Bruin once the married couple gets back to Britain. We're just starting right away with this nonsense. But when Henry's father suddenly died, Libby knew there'd be even more pressure on him to lead a certain That's kind of life. And Libby was no one's idea of a lady. Yep, she was just a conventionally attractive, physically fit white woman. People must have discriminated against her horribly. This whole movie, they want Daphne and her mother to seem like they are acid tripping Burning Man hippies, when really they are just completely average people People, but wearing headbands and flare jeans. Henry knows all about it. If you love Henry, you will go now. I think you should see this. Apparently there's someone else. <gasps> so it was all a setup by the meddling political advisor. We love a shocking twist ending that comes four minutes into the movie. How come I don't even know who this character is yet, but I already know that he was secretly the bad guy the whole time? No, not good writing. But a few months later, fate gave her the greatest gift of all, a beautiful baby girl named Daphne. And I never wrote, called, or emailed the baby's rich, connected father ever again, just because someone handed me a letter that I had no proof was actually from him. From an adult perspective, the plot of this movie seems a little preposterous. We're supposed to believe that these two people, who by their own words, fell madly, passionately, hopelessly in love, just walked away from each other without a single direct conversation, even after she had a baby with him and he didn't know? Like, what? The second I got that positive pregnancy test, I would have been in the Walmart parking lot on my burner phone. Like, if you don't want the British press to know about this, you better buy my silence. Okay, so that concludes that flashback and like random voiceover from another person. On my 17th birthday, mom and I had to work, but it turned out to be where my story really began. So then that should be where the whole movie begins. You just said so yourself. Why would you show me anything before the story begins? I could have been buying Sour Patch Kids in the lobby. We just dug our way through like 17 layers of voiceovers and flashbacks from different characters. And I think all of that information could have been delivered throughout the rest of the movie and it would have been much more surprising and effective. Arguably, they needed to set it up with this prologue to make sure that kids were really gonna be following along with the whole plot. But arguably as well, you could say that that's kind of underestimating the intelligence of your audience. The thing is, kids don't need to like understand every single detail of the movie right off the bat, like, cause they'll still enjoy it. And that's another reason that they'll keep enjoying it as they get older. They'll understand more and more about it. Don't cater to your young audience by dumbing things down for them and handing it to them. You know, allow your content to lift them up to your level of intelligence when they're viewing it. So Daphne's mother is played by Kelly Preston and she actually sings all of her own vocals in this cause she's like a wedding singer. Meanwhile, Daphne is the do 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 waiter. It's our wedding day. Where is he? Yeah. Very funny. Whoa. Hey, how you doing? Did Buddy the Cake Boss just hit on a child? I love this stereotypical Italian American wedding. I keep waiting for Sofia Coppola to get shot on the church steps. And I'm actually allowed to be offended by this representation, okay? I have a capital R in the middle of my name. My people have struggled. I believe this scene is meant to show that Daphne is a caring and intelligent and quick on her feet person. It does not give me that sense. I'm sorry, can I borrow this? Imagine seeing seeing a server at your wedding do this? Like, what's the customary gratuity for a cater waiter who spent the entire reception wilding the f out? Like, every cup here has ice in it. Please don't hammer on my $600 ice sculpture. Wakey, wakey. Oh, 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 oh. Smart plan. I guess I just don't understand why this was any of your business. I'd be bridezilla. Like, if the tempura vegetables don't get passed around because this girl with main character syndrome thinks she's J-Lo in The Wedding Planner, I will get a divorce and we will start this all over. There are a couple moments in this film where Daphne livens up a stuffy party where everyone seems completely unfamiliar with the universal concept of dance. Benny, look, my arms are moving to the music like I'm in a Broadway play. Yes, lady, it's called doing the hustle. It happens at every wedding. Daphne runs into a friend from high school, and this is just a device to give us some exposition. I mean, where are you going to college? That would be the University of the Undecided. Cool, will they have an eyelash curler you can use there? I'm just saying. It's probably not fair to judge someone based on the way their makeup looked in 2003 
come to think of it, it's probably not fair to judge someone based on the way their makeup looks ever. Hmm, I wonder what my problem is then. Let's just all agree that I'm too far in to ever stop. So at this point, f your frosted eyeshadow. Daphne gets super emotional watching the father-daughter dance, even though some of those people are clearly grandfathers. And this leads her to talk to her mom about how she misses her dad. I know you think you're doing the right thing by keeping me from him, but I- I, I was trying to protect you from getting hurt the same way I was. You left him. It's not like he jumped on a plane and came after me, Daphne. Well, maybe he would have if he knew I existed. It's an excellent point. You're right. Also, far be it for me to judge a single mother's actions, but wouldn't she have been protecting Daphne more if she simply never told her the story that glorifies her father and identifies him as a public figure? She could have said, sweetie, your dad died of alcoholism before you were born, and it literally would have been a happy ending for everyone. So she brought this on herself. This whole movie is her fault. The mom continues to have kind of sketchy reasoning for why she literally will not let her go see the dad. Getting to know someone because they share the same DNA with you isn't the answer. It's about getting to know yourself. I've already met me. I want to know why I have daddy issues that make me want to bang Bob Saget. This mom is a piece of work. Daphne is almost 18 and she's like, no, sweetie, you don't need to meet your father because I don't want you to. I love you a million Swedish fish. I love you a million red M&Ms. I'm team one million Swedish fish, although I could probably eat one million red M&Ms if they were refrigerated. M&Ms are so good cold. Also, you would expect this cute little phrase to come up at least one more time throughout the movie, but nope, it's just a one-time thing for you. That night, Daphne looks on the computer and researches Lord Henry Dashwood, who she knows to be her father, and then she packs up her one tiny backpack and heads out the door. I don't know how she goes to London with that little baby bag and she never repeats an outfit once this whole movie. I really wish there was more of an inciting incident that caused her to be like, all right, it's time to go to London. Other than this kind of out of nowhere conversation on her, I get that it was her birthday. I think it would have made Daphne a stronger character if she had a little bit more personal drive and determination. It kind of just feels like she's like, okay, I'm gonna leave and sneak off to Europe. Like with what money, how? They don't tell us any of that. Like we could have had more of a motivating factor to get her out the door, I think. Like she could find out somehow through her mother's story that Lord Henry Dashwood is her father. And so she finds out like, oh, people who are from the royal family can get a huge scholarship to schools or like I'd be able to go to any school in London. That would be a great opportunity. And the mom can be like, you don't need him, blah, blah, blah. That family, you don't need handouts from them. Then it would make more sense for the mom to be like, you don't want any money from them. They suck. Look at me fixing this on the fly. <laughs> Put my hands up and shout. That's Kelly Preston singing that song. Tell me that you say you will shout, shout. This is such a movie cliche at this point that when I first visit London, if that song isn't blaring when I first step out of the airport, I'm gonna be disappointed. And then I'll have no choice but to colonize your land. So can I sleep on someone's couch somewhere? Obligatory montage of the girl reading her butt guidebook, riding on a double-decker bus. What's her name? Daphne gets to her hostel where we meet a boy. Are you a musician? No, but I live with one back home. Oh. My mom. Oh. She's been dead for seven years. Oh. This actor is forever playing the first musician that the cute girl sees when she arrives at a new location. This is Oliver James in his kind of breakout film role in the U.S. film market. This allowed him to come to Los Angeles where he was then cast alongside Hilary Duff in Raise Your Voice, where we've seen him before. There's a little bit of a language barrier for British people. Did you know? I should warn you though, the dog and bones on the plane can be no lift here. Girl, you know I'm from New York, so maybe save the Cockney rhyming slang for when Kira Knightley shuffles into this crusty hostel you work at. He said, oh, you're from America? Cool, so fancy a spot of what a bottle of chocolate on my fair lady. Like no one can understand you. What? Translation. Phone, it's broken. Elevator, none. Who's free? Oh, and Louisa over here likes to loudly announce every time she's done taking a shit. Welcome home. They're like a big family here. It's time for a quick update from Expositional News. When Lord Henry Dashwood announced today that he was giving up his hereditary seat in the House of Lords to run for election as a commoner. Why should an accident of birth give me the right to make decisions for the people of this country? Eh, it seems like kind of a risk. I think the British government loves being run by unelected officials who are put there because their great-great-grandparents claim to be chosen by God. But Colin Firth here wants the people to actually vote for him? Did some of that wacky democracy rub off on you when you 
that American chick in the desert. Of course, Daphne's learning all the lovely details about what a great person her father is from the television. Sorry, the telly. Lord Dashwood, who will marry his fiance, Glynis Payne, will also inherit a stepdaughter, the lovely Clarissa Payne. Wow, this reporter is covering a lot of disparate facts within a 30 second news story. He said Henry Dashwood is running as a commoner and he's getting married soon and his fiance has a daughter. Like, I guess that follows the inverted pyramid structure, but the details kind of sound like the gossip I would get from my British gay hairdresser. Can you see him? He's cutting my hair right now. Oh, thank you, Mr. Peabody. It looks fab. Let's jump over to the royal family and see what it's like in Colin Firth's world. And his name is really Henry. You're young, trusting, idealistic. And a fabulous fiance with all the right connections. <laughs> <laughs> okay, confidence. Imagine someone coming into the room so hot on themselves that they instantly suck up all the oxygen in the room. I swear, being a rich white lady must feel like being on full-time crystal meth. So that that woman, Glynis, is actually the daughter of that older political advisor who gave the false letter in the prologue. Sorry to interrupt, Daddy, but if I don't steal Henry away this minute, he'll miss his speech. My speech. Right-hand pocket, darling. <laughs> She thinks of everything. Lady, come on. If she worked at an office, she would be one of those people who refuses to use their vacation days because they think everything will fall apart without them. Well, guess what? This is capitalism. You could die in a train accident and we would just find someone else who knows how to fix the printer. You can tell how scheming this family is right off the bat. How's our boy doing? I'd say if he doesn't ruffle too many feathers, we're looking at the next prime minister. If you say, how's our boy to your father about the man that you're marrying like he's a racehorse, then I think you need to look inward at your weird calculating personality. Also, I'm just gonna say it. I think kind of all of the father-daughter relationships shown throughout this movie are uncomfortable for one reason or another. That's just my opinion. And I know a thing or two about uncomfortable relationships, okay? Just ask that 10th grade math teacher who worked at my high school. Actually, you can't. I think he left the country after that. Daphne is wondering if she should even go through with meeting Henry. They're so elegant and sophisticated. Maybe I should just go home and let him get on with his life. Or maybe you could have, I don't know, called ahead or tried to contact him on Facebook first. But since you're here, it's not too late to go the extortion route. In a display of stunning irresponsibility, Daphne just shows up to Dashwood Manor being like, hi, um, my dad might be in there. Like, I don't know why she doesn't ever try to contact anybody on his team to be like, I'm gonna come drop by. Like, did you want to meet him or did you want this to go poorly because if you're gonna surprise him it's gonna go poorly anyway she doesn't get in through the front gate she decides to go around the back for some reason are you for real mama 9-11 just happened you're gonna catch a rubber bullet to the back of the head so fast doing that inside glennis and her daughter caroline i think her name is are talking like oh once you marry henry we won't have to try so hard to be in high society so you can tell that they're just like going for the gold what? that what an impossibly large bird falling off that wall Ooh, looks like we got a lot of royal blood in this one don't we how are you that bad at identifying other humans that you think it's a prehistoric dodo bird baby eats a crumpet for breakfast and thinks she's alice in wonderland all of a sudden we get more confirmation that these two are scheming conniving little girls when i run this house senile servants will be the first thing to go you have to get around the old bat somehow she'd never allow it see my pruning shears. The old bat seems to have forgotten where she put them. Yeah, do these people not understand how full volume talking works? Why does the whole household just put up with these blatant gold diggers sitting in their castle and sucking up all their oatmeal? I would be like, if you two are gonna sit around and gossip like scullery maids, you can go churn butter and you can go clean up after the horses before I take your ass to school like Professor McGonagall. Ooh, Professor McGonagall. <laughs> That's my Professor McGonagall impression. <laughs> the whole gang catches Daphne in the window, so they obviously chase after her because they're like, that's a security threat. Usually though the person who is being secured wouldn't go and chase after the reporter but that's what happens where do you think you're going to you how long do you people have to spy on me before you realize there is no story here? I'm glad she's not actually a reporter because then the story would be how he grabbed a reporter's wrists and screamed in their face, which would only turn me on. I would be like, oops, you caught me. I love your Earl Grey mouth smells. Side note, I was not being his teenage daughter in that role play. Let's move on. So after some talking and talky talkiness, which lasts, I don't know, 5,000 minutes, they believe that Daphne is the daughter. She has the birth certificate. She has his eyes, she says. So Dashwood is angry that the mom didn't tell him that she had given birth to their daughter. How could she keep something like this from me? Excuse me, what happened to the mistake theory we were operating on a moment ago? Glynis is so in her bag right now. She said, I don't care about your estranged daughter. I'm trying to get 
down on some royal bed sheets this season. Let's just get Maury in here to prove you're not the father so this chick can go back to working at the chip shop. I think one reason that there was this weird silence between Henry and Daphne's mom for 17 years is because this whole story is based on a play from 1958 called The Reluctant Debutante. So, I mean, in 1958, I think it would make more sense for someone to father a child and never know about it because there weren't all of these different ways of getting in touch with someone overseas. They barely updated the whole script to make it feel modern because none of the story really kind of matches how things work in the present day. My mother and I were married. <laughs> Bedouin ceremony in Morocco. Well, anyway, she left. Apparently taking something of yours with her. I'll put a cork in it, Clarissa. Maybe someone should have put a cork in it 17 years ago. Oh. Did she want him to put a cork in his penis? Also, this screenplay never misses a chance to remind you that Daphne's parents were in fact married when they had sex. You've got to include a puritanical sense of shame in your film if you want to keep those conservatives at the MPAA from burning a cross in your lawn. Do you guys have this thing where you're talking too much that you can't breathe? <laughs> I'm like, Ugh, cross in your lawn. Ugh, something about racism, Ugh, social justice. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm not clear on the family relations, but I think Daphne and this woman are grandma parents. Thank you so much, Lady Dashwood. Oh, no hugs, dear. I'm British. We only show affection to dogs and horses. She just made it sound like British people like to f horses. I know that's not what she meant to say, but if the horse penis fits, no, that's not the phrase. Naturally, Henry gets on the phone with his estranged wife to be like, we have a daughter. I didn't want her to get hurt. What is that supposed to mean? Ask her advisors. They've gotten you this far, haven't they? Despite this cryptic comment, Henry does not go on to ask his advisors about their scheme. He just sits down in his brown book room with his carousel of brown books. This room of old encyclopedias is the closest a British royal can get to expressing their leather fetish. He sniffs those books all night like, A is for astronaut, baby. Take me to the moon. Basically, uh, Henry's political team decides we can spin this daughter thing into a story where like you're reconnecting with this former daughter. <laughs> Whatever. They think they can spin it. Even though it's sort of like a My Fair Lady situation where they're like, we gotta fix her up. The only thing we know about her is that she's an American teenager. Hardly a promising start. <laughs> the British to American snobbery in this is a little over the top. American movies love to perpetuate the idea that the English look down on us because again, it gives white people here something to feel persecuted about even though their great great grandparents house was built by enslaved Africans. We're like, you fancy British people with your king and queen like it's the olden days. Yeah, well, it's still the olden days for the United States too. Only for us, that means Jim Crow laws and a KKK run police why is that better for you? Talking about the British like we're a revolutionary pamphlet in 1808. This blonde Clarissa, I hope her name's Clarissa. Clarissa, I said it right. Clarissa explains it all. So Ian, the cute boy, calls the palace and Clarissa's like, yeah, I'll definitely let Daphne know. So she's not getting any of the information. Meanwhile, she's eavesdropping, getting the info that, you know, basically Daphne is moving in on her daddy. It's weird, right? Like this fighting over daddy thing. I don't love it. I brought this for you. It's some pictures of me growing up and stuff. Like Thank you. I'm just not really a looking at scrapbooks type of person. No, it's okay. You can take it with you. Fun fact, I actually hate looking at people's vacation photos. It's like so boring. And then I feel guilty for not being interested. And I have to think of questions. I'm like, oh, what did they give you on the plane? Pretzels? I promise I'm not stuck up. It just sounds that way based on the way that I act and talk. Let me drink some of this bounce. <laughs> So Clarissa pulls this trick where she's like, oh, we're going to this dress show, which is like a fancy fashion show. And Clarissa deceives Daphne into thinking she can dress casual for it, even though it's obviously a formal event. Meanwhile, Ian outside can't even get to see Daphne. What? Could you move away yeah, now, right. please, Chill out, mate. Sir. He don't own the place. No, but he is paid to keep people out of there. Sometimes I think these kids feel like they're being looked down upon for being poor when really they're just being stopped from entering a private property. But upstairs, Daphne is trying her hardest to get ready, but she just can't because she's too quirky. Do you know it's hard for a quirky girl to take a shower? Because things happen when you turn on a faucet. <laughs> Oh, 
What, so now we don't have bathtubs in the USA? If this were in my house, I would be like, listen, you're obviously adorable, but I can't have a manic pixie dream daughter run in these hallways messing up my bathroom floor. So thanks for visiting. Do you have Uber on your phone? Because Daphne is all caught up in the bathtub, like she cannot figure that out, they go on to the fashion show without her. She has to get there later. Also because, you know, Henry's being pulled away by the two jealous women. So of course, when <laughs> Daphne gets to the front of the fashion show, they're like, oh no, the show's already started. You can't come in. So as she loves to do, she goes around the back entrance. What is with this stereotype that in the UK, back entrances are somehow more open than the front entrance? Like if there's a security guard at the front entrance, you think the back door is just going to be open? I mean, I guess sometimes she just climbs the fence, but they would be seeing that too, probably. Thanks to this oblivious fashion show employee, she ends up in the wrong place. Is this the way to the show? Yes, darling. Go, go. You're off. Uh. By God, it's Samuel L. Jackson. There really just hasn't been one building or event that Daphne hasn't been late to and arrived through the back entrance in some clumsily endearing way. Well, you know what I think is endearing? Being on time, using the front door. Do I ever get to see this character just get inside without going through three rounds of wipeout? For a moment, Daphne seems a little caught off guard that she's on stage, but then she just decides to work it because she's what? A quirky girl. Love the delirious self-confidence. Seems a little unfair to all the dress designers who work so hard to show their stuff. She said, I'm from America. My bell-bottom jeans are just as good. Okay, but to all of us, you just look like a drunk person who walked in off the street. Hair all messed up with your split end. Girl, put your jacket back on. Where's her hat? Also, you'll notice some subtle branding for L Girl, like that teen magazine of the time, which I also think has gone the way of Teen Vogue. Who is that adorable creature? You can dump tea in my harbor anytime. Dump tea in your harbor? I guess we know which one of these young lords is a secret bottom trying to act like he's into girls. He said, I'd let her ride me like Paul Revere through the streets of Lexington. Ooh, the British are coming. One thing you need to know about Daphne is she's clumsy, okay? Other girls might be elegant, okay? They might sit like this, mm -hmm, and they might drink tea like this, mm -hmm that, okay? Not Daphne, okay? She's a real girl. She eats french fries. She puts on just mascara sometimes. She wears chapstick and Doc Martens. She likes fashion blogs on Tumblr. So she's not just gonna stand there and not fall over. That's your fault for thinking that. I say, you're right. You sure? Oh, that ADR on the Prince Charles lookalike was not ready for broadcast, in my opinion. We are. We are, sure. You'll see they also have a lookalike for Prince Harry and William there, too. Also, Daphne would invite herself onto a runway stage and then fall off of it for no reason. She's like an underbaked Zoe Deschanel. For some reason, the royal family, like, was charmed by Daphne falling into his old, brittle lap. You would have broken Prince Charles's femurs if you fell into his lap, even 20 years ago, I bet. They love to give Daphne these moments where she tells off Clarissa, like they really give her a lot of power and like not standing down in the face of this mean girl, which I thought was refreshing. Like she tells off the mean girl and is not trying to play it sweet. Like the main character in a lot of other movies where it's like, I'm gonna kill them with kindness. She really does stand up for herself. It's just like, it kind of softens the intimidation factor for me. My evil stepsister. You've seen Cinderella, right? Let me clue you in. I win. <laughs> Girl, just because you show up to parties where nobody knows you, it doesn't make you Cinderella. Insult the snobby girls all you want, but did you have to stick your fingers into that hors d'oeuvre and then walk away? I wanted to eat that. Let me eat the ham roll, Daphne. Daphne, you better give me that ham roll. Put your finger in my ham roll, Daphne. <laughs> Daphne charms the pants off of the stuffy society lady who like has a little dog and the dog doesn't normally like people, but she likes Daphne. That's a sign that Daphne is an angel. She's Peggy Sue, everybody loves you. So in this kind of little conversation, Henry Dashwood is like, why yes, my daughter will be staying with us for the season. So that means Daphne gets to stay for the whole summer. They don't really ever mention what season it is. I assume it's summer because she's out of school and talking about college, it must be before her last year of college or is she supposed to be going to college in the fall. We don't know. If she's supposed to be going to college in the fall, she should have already decided at some point. Maybe she's taking a gap year. I'm talking too much. Anyway, that night, Benry and Johnny Don bond. <gasps> what are you doing up so late? Jet lag. I mean, you've been here for several days now, but sure, just say whatever you think 12 year olds will sound cool, I guess. They're bonding over cereal, which I get. Do you like Cocoa Pops? There's chocolate. Need I say more? Am I right, ladies? <laughs> 
Also, any like chocolate cereal is technically just like cocoa flavored sweetened rice puffs or something. It's not legally chocolate, which is why in all the commercials they can only talk about it being chocolatey tasting. Like it tastes so chocolatey. Chocolatey taste of cocoa puffs. An epic mashup of peanut butter and chocolatey flavor. Since when can we turn chocolate into an adjective? Chocolatey? I don't know why I think about it so much. I guess I'm just someone who believes that words matter and truth matters. That's why I fight every day to talk about cereal on here. There are moments like this where you can kind of tell that this is the first leading movie role for Amanda Bynes. The performance is a little overly sweet and she's a little too easygoing at some times where I'm like, are you a human being or a human hacky sack? So Dashwood's like, oh, I'm gonna throw a debutante party for you, a coming out party so that you can be introduced to high society as an eligible maiden. I don't want that, okay? He's trying to explain to her that it means that she can then date, but he's like tongue tied about it for some reason. I'm not explaining this very well. Then. No, not at all, but I'm having fun watching you try. No, not at all, but I'm having fun watching you try. I really expected to like this movie, but it's just so cheesy, cheesy chicken pasta sometimes. It kind of stings to see Amanda Bynes not at the full comedic strength of some of her later film performances, or even her TV performances that predated this. It's not her fault. I think the material is just not meant to be like a straight comedy. It's kind of a more sentimental film. Clearly, they make better use of Amanda Bynes when it's like a broad comedy for kids. And I guess I just have a hard time feeling for Daphne as a character because she really doesn't have a whole lot to lose right now. I don't care about her anymore because she's not an orphan and she's not funny. Get Short Round from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom in here. He was both. Then I'll be laughing like a horse. Oh, that's my horse laugh. Oh, you like my horse laugh? Let me eat an apple in front of you out of your hand. Oh, oh, oh. They're getting ready for some social event again. Like I think it's a coming out party for two other local princey girls. And Daphne's put in this comedically ruffly dress and she finally tells on the girl. You've got a mansion, I have a five floor walk up. You're snotty little miss cranky pants and I go with the flow. So here's a little pointer for you. Get over yourself and stop trying to be my daddy's little girl because I'm not going anywhere. It's not super intimidating when you say out loud that the only thing at stake is being daddy's favorite girl. And at first I was like, oh, I love that they had her tell off the mean girl this early on in the film. But then I'm kind of like, oh wait, it's the first act and we just lost our basic main direct antagonist. So for the rest of the movie, I'm like, what are we scared of again? What's at risk? Nothing? Okay. I know you've heard me say it before, but I'm gonna say it again, baby. The stakes need to be higher. Um, raise the stakes. Raise the stakes. Raise the stakes. I don't know why I did that. But the grandmother basically is like, don't be intimidated by these girls. It's because they're threatened by you. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. But we are learning it too early. She should still be intimidated by them or at least have it seem like they can take something away from her. Like there's really nothing that these two characters can do that will make it seem like Henry Dashwood wouldn't want to know his daughter anymore. Like she is not going anywhere. They should be doing something to try to prove that she's lying, right? Like they should be falsifying some sort of evidence that she's not really related to him or get some fake doctored video that she's just doing this to get money or so that she can get into college. That would be my version of the script. It's like she meets him so that she can get the scholarship for college, but she ends up loving her dad, but then they misrepresent it so that it's like, she's just using you for college money. And then she has to like, be like, I've learned so much about myself. That would be my movie version of it. What would be yours? Let me know in the comments below. It's okay if you just say you like mine best because it's good. Okay, so we're at this coming out ball for these two twins. So are those the girls that are coming out? Oh uh, yes, that's Peach and Pear Orwood. They're the precious daughters of Lord Orwood. Just... The real love of his life is that chandelier up there. That's code for this chandelier is falling down by the end of the scene. Also, does he really love that lighting fixture more than his own daughters? I mean, I get it. Sometimes I worry that I would visibly hesitate to save a drowning person because I would be afraid of getting my iPhone wet. Ah, the snobby girls continue to snobby. Fiona. 38 people would have to die for her to be queen. Well, it's far less than the 72 you'd need. I'm sorry, we're talking about all your parents and relatives dying, right? And this is supposed to be the classy part of society? Okay. In America, at least people don't kill their whole family for a pointless title. We do it for insurance money or no reason. Ian lets Daphne know that this is going to ruin the girl's social life if they don't have a fun coming out party. And it's like, it seems like none of these parties would be fun. So I don't see how that's the truth. But anyway, Daphne of course has to step in because she She's the hero of parties, as you remember from the ice sculpture thing. What do you say we liven things up a little bit? Get the party started. I could get fired. Wimp. No. No. For me? Why do you want him to get fired? Not everybody can just run to go visit their wealthy dad every time they run out of stuff to do in their own country. Oh, I forgot to mention, Ian is playing music at this song and dance festival, <laughs> this party. He's at everything. He worked at the 
hostile. Now he's a musician at this party. How nice. So he starts playing fun music and Daphne is like, have you guys heard of movement? Once again, I believe British people are aware of dancing, so they probably wouldn't approach it like space aliens. Oh, is this like what from the Beatles been done? I go right to Cockney for some reason. Sorry to British people. I know not everybody speaks with a Cockney accent. Just me, just been me when I chimney sweep. Blame Mary Poppins. So everyone's loving the party, but unfortunately the music gets so loud that it somehow compromises the integrity of the lighting fixture that we love so much. Like, mama, this thing wasn't well attached to the ceiling if some speakers can knock it down, but okay. <laughs> That political visor is in the rafters with his gardening shears, like, damn it, I missed. Also, it would be nice if Chekhov's chandelier could have added somewhat to the conflict of this movie when it fulfilled its destiny of hitting the ground. But most of the trouble Daphne gets into is actually inconsequential. It's just supposed to show that, like, the press is like, oh, Mr. Dashwood is not as responsible as we thought he was. But because Daphne is such a free spirit, she's actually rubbing off on Lord Henry Dashwood, and he's starting to get back into his love of music again, rock and roll eating toast, I guess. Gillian, darling, yes, I'm sorry, it's been awful. Oh, I forgot that the way people eat toast is hereditary. Also, are my royal taxes paying for all this redundant butter and jam on the table uh, during war times? All those mouth sound effects, by the way, make me sick. Sucking butter off your finger? What? And you better admit in the comments if you started eating your toast this way as a little kid when you saw this movie. If I was nine when this movie came out and not 12, I would have wanted to be Daphne so bad. Henry gets a chance to meet Ian, the kind of pseudo boyfriend, when he takes Daphne out on a date and they go to some like seaside outdoor market. I'm not sure where this is. If you live in London, you can let me know if this is like a landmark shopping area. It seems like it would be. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, a bindi. How appropriative for your costume. Did you unscrew a metal washer from this tent and glue it to your forehead? Because I don't think anyone who works here gave that to you. We get a little more insight into Ian's backstory. It's tragic. My mother was a dead and then she chose to marry beneath her. Her parents promptly disowned her. But for some reason they took pity on me, their half-breed grandson. They paid me to go to all the right schools. Oh my god, that sounds horrible. They gave you free school? Are you gonna be okay? So Henry is like a half-breed. That's what they keep calling him. I'm not saying that. <laughs> His family was disowned, but he still gets to go to the fancy school. So I'm like, you still get all the benefits, just not the social prison. Anyway, Henry is learning what it means to be a father. Five hours ago, your daughter rode off on the back of a motorcycle and hasn't been heard from since. Are we talking about a day? Well, I, I don't know, but I can trench it. You can tell the mom is the cool, free-spirited one. Drinking OJ out of the carton, letting her daughter go missing in a foreign country. Reminds me of Woodstock, man. Strange how easy it comes, isn't it? What? Worrying. Does it ever go away? No, Henry, it doesn't. I mean, you seem pretty calm right now. I think she was just washing down a Percocet with that Tropicana when he called. I can't stand a sappy parental moment, okay? I didn't appreciate boring scenes like this when I was a kid, and I certainly don't want them now. I don't have kids. That's why I have time to sit and watch this 20-year-old movie and make a comment for every one minute of runtime. If I had to choose between this or feeding a child, <laughs> I'm sorry, but little Timmy is going to be way behind on the growth curve next year because I have an online audience. Uh, online I I have an online I I have an online audience. I have an online audience. I have an online audience. Uh, where's my medal? Where's my estranged father? Well, I have an online audience. <laughs> That's my new favorite thing to say when I'm not getting the attention I need. I'm in the emergency room. Excuse me, I have an online audience. Next up, Daphne goes to this, another fancy event called the regatta. I don't know, I think that's like a boat thing. I stopped paying attention to what these events were because they don't matter to the plot. Like if they were somehow building towards a climax, like she was training to be a debutante or had to learn some sort of British history and go to museums, like then I would feel like a little more engaged with what's going on here. But as it is, it's just a bunch of convenient things where like splashy set pieces can happen. Hey, hey what are you doing? 
you doing here? Well, you know, another one of my glamorous jobs. Both glamorous and impossibly convenient. This is job number three or four that just happens to be wherever Daphne ends up. Now, I've never been to London, but I'm pretty sure it's bigger than the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal Studios. There's this snobby guy who Clarissa really wants to get with, but he's always hitting on Daphne because everyone loves Daphne. So there's a little competition between him and Ian. Are you afraid she might prefer musicians to Cambridge boys? No. Breeding always wins out in the end. Oh, interesting theory. What German Reich is that from? Wait, I bet I can guess. All this talk about breeding, either Eugene Eugenics over here is all about the Aryan, or he wants to have Ross sex with Ian. Some of the slang is different over there, so I get confused. We see Peach and Pear the twins at some point, and it's like, oh, they look stylish now because of Daphne. So everyone loves Daphne, Caroline's jealous. But this snobby guy continues to hit on her and gets handsy. And that's why she has no choice but to do the thing that happens in every teen movie, we've ever seen, someone fully clothed falls into a pool. The height of physical comedy for a kid's movie. I mean, it's not that big of a deal when that happens, right? Like, we, by this point, we've seen a thousand cell phone videos of people falling into pools. It's just a little desensitized to it. It's either this or someone falls into a cake. I'm like, why can't we have an electrical fire? <laughs> Oh my God, Daphne, you killed him. He hit his head on a rock and drowned. I love the idea of this becoming an episode of Locked Up Abroad and Daphne goes on trial for murder. That would get me back on board with this movie. Get me the rewrites, send me the pages. So after Daphne pushes this gentleman into the water, all the paparazzi are snapping pics, trying to get the pics. So Henry throws her onto a Vespa that I guess he's stealing. He's just stealing a vehicle and they drive out of there causing an even bigger scene than if they had just quietly left. So he's not really helping his own PR team here. But this just all goes to show that Daphne's uh, having an adverse effect on his image and his standing in the polls. But before they head back to the palace, they make a day of it. They go back to the shopping center that we've already been at with Ian. So, I mean, I would have loved maybe a different iconic London location. Maybe they could visit Big Ben. Maybe they could stand in one of those telephone booths that are red. Maybe they could get a Cadbury cream egg from the market. I want to go to the UK and I eat all of the chocolates. The chocolates that you have in Europe are better. The chocolates that you have in better Europe, yada. <laughs> so they get it. <laughs> Whoa. So next up, Henry gets some body art. How you doing? That, that doesn't sound pleasant. Henna tattoos shouldn't be painful. I think he's getting attacked in there. There are like three different montages where Daphne or Henry get into a little fabric changing booth at this outdoor market. Why would he even need privacy for a henna tattoo? Does anyone from London know what's going on here? Another changing room montage where she tries on different outfits. Like we get it. She can change her outfit. You can tell that Daphne's rubbing off on Henry. He's breaking back into his old routines. The producer said, we're gonna bury these little girls in so much Colin Firth ass, they won't be able to breathe. Give the video a thumbs up if this movie turned you on to Colin Firth and Leather Daddies. The like button is an anonymous support group for all of us. I mean, all of you. Wait, am I allowed to like my own videos? Because uh, now that all of this bad press is out, Dashwood Henry, comma, is learning that he's dropping in the polls. The headlines are negative. They're saying he's lost his responsible edge. We used to love the way that he was always on time to meetings, but now he's was pushing people in to the river off a duck. So Daphne knows that if she wants to stay in her father's life, she has to change and act like a Dashwood. Ooh, the handheld shot of the closet being emptied out. This is a weird staple for a lot of turning points in a kid's movie that I think had an influence on the tantrums I threw as a kid. I was like, hmm, I guess if I tear apart my room, it's gonna get my point across even more. We go into this really brief montage that's basically just newspaper headings of her looking demure and smiling nicely at events. And they're like, Lady Dashwood stuns us with her being nice. Oh, she didn't in the salad bowl today. Oh, today she got through five minutes without falling over herself, like good for her. And then when she sees Ian, he's like, what is wrong? You're like, you are you can't come to the concert with me? What the hell? You've changed so much. So it's our third act conflict. We love to see it. But the old lady is like reminding her something, something, something. It's not the crown that makes the queen. 
It's what's in here. Grandma, are you talking about your stoma? It's not fair that I can't be queen without a chest tube. And just based on what we heard, it kind of sounds like neither of you are going to be queen unless something really tragic happens at a family reunion while you're both running late. The time has finally come for Daphne's debutante ball. She's going to be coming out to society and be like, hi, hey, gentlemen, you can f me now. Put a baby in this basket. Uh -huh. So she makes her grand entrance to say just that. Daphne, you look different. Yeah, I was gonna say that you look different. Then I was gonna push you down these last couple steps. Obviously, he was going to say that you look beautiful. They wrote this thing like a fantasy romance movie, but for kids who don't have a good relationship with their stepdad. In a four times a charm type of thing with convenience and coincidences, Ian is playing the music at this royal event. I guess they explained it like, oh, since he has good breeding, he was able to get in all the good music clubs and that's why he's a royal musician now. But then shouldn't he not have to work at a hostel too? I don't know. Anyway, he doesn't like Daphne anymore because she's wearing a dress. What happened to the old you? The real you? Well, you've known her for like seven days or so and you spent most of that time working at different car parks. Also, other than making it through like a couple events without a Mr. Bean physical comedy bit, I don't think she's acting that different. So obviously, Daphne's feeling really down about herself. She feels not herself at all, which is perfect timing for her to get a taste of home. home. <gasps> Jocelyn thought you might need a pal while you're being fed to the sharks. Was Jocelyn keeping Daphne's mom hidden away from her all day in some other part of the castle? Why couldn't they get ready together? The mind games that this family plays never end. It's diabolical. Daphne is so happy to see her parents reuniting on this night and she overhears some news. Look what he did with Daphne. Hmm? Quite an achievement, wasn't it? I thought I was gonna have to get rid of her. Like I had to get rid of her mother. What did you just say? Uh, nothing. Imagine if Daphne wasn't lucky enough to be walking by while the British people were incriminating themselves. Then this movie would be even longer. I swear, aside from storming fashion shows and being fun at parties, this character is more passive than I am aggressive. She's such a weak character at this point that people can just sort of start dragging and pushing her wherever they need her to go. Clinus! Let go! Clinus! Get in here! Clinus! Oh. Hey, I'm all in favor of quickly escalating from an unpleasant conversation to a felony, but how exactly does this false imprisonment improve Glynis' situation in any way? It adds texture, I guess, a handful of crazy croutons, but it's not gonna ultimately help her in her effort to get married to Lord Dashwood. She just made herself look criminally insane for what? So that Daphne would miss her father-daughter dance at a party that's about her? Like, what does that matter? But while Daphne is locked away in a closet, we see that her mom and dad are reconnecting for the first time in years after abruptly falling out of love. I mean, okay. Remember the ritual dances? You were so bad, I think they're still blaming you for the locust. Is it just me or does that joke feel a little racist? I had to have you translate my apology. For all I knew, you could have been trading men for a goat. Camel, actually. Is it just me or does that joke feel a little bit sexist? Wait, did I say the same thing twice? I try to tune myself out after I record the intro. Because Daphne's locked away, Lord Dashwood has to take the father-daughter dance with Clarissa, which you know what that means absolutely nothing. Luckily, Kel Kelly Preston, Daphne's mom, finds her and lets her out of the closet. How dare you, Glenn? Darling, you don't want a scene now, do you? Take your hand off my daughter. You won't get a scene, you get a Broadway musical. No one mourns the wicked. Sorry, it seems like a part of my subconscious was really eagerly waiting for that cue. I think some deep part of my gay brain is just always waiting for the stage manager to call places. This is the time when Daphne walks up and gives Carolissa a piece of her mind. What are you doing? Finally giving you what you deserve. I don't want it. I know you're all having a tense conversation over here, but is it okay if I start moving in on some of those mini quiches? Some of us here are trying to enjoy the party. Of course, Henry chases Daphne when she runs away and they have this brief, sad moment. You know, Daphne, maybe we're just trying to make something work here, which- Pray be upstanding for Her Majesty the Queen. Go ahead, duty calls. I don't know why she feels like she served there because it sounds like she was just getting father-daughter dumped. He was literally about to say, I don't think this is working out. And she goes, you can't fire me, I quit. Because of this, Daphne goes back to New York with her mother and she's all sad there thinking of her dad when she's looking at people on motorbikes or pouring cereal. Ian is sad. Everyone's sad for this moment. Uh, 
uh, I don't think Rice Krispies need to be aerated like that, so you can probably pour that from a height of less than six inches. They both eat toast the same way, and they both eat cereal some weird way. Next, Lord Henry Dashwood. I hate calling, I keep calling him like Lord Henry Dashwood. Henry goes to his group of people. I don't know anything about British politics, but he's the Prime Minister family. He's going to talk to the family of Prime Ministers, and he says this. Which is why I must now respectfully withdraw my candidacy. Oh. As important as my political aspirations are to me, there is one thing that matters more. And then he leaves. I swear, this whole scene could have been three seconds long. But he said every word like this. Like, speed it up, mama. We're trying to get to those end credits. Before he is able to leave, he gets some even more dreadful news from the advisor. I saved your family's reputation. When I found out that that girl was pregnant, I knew I was doing the right thing. <laughs> Wait, how did Alistair find out that Libby was pregnant before Henry did? She got the test results and said, oh, I've got to go tell my husband's political advisor. I do love the punching, though. Violence for children. Henry, darling, Henry. I know daddy's been naughty, but what about me? <laughs> That's affirmative action, I'm just kidding. He does not punch his fiance because somehow that would be too violent for a kid's movie, but breaking an old man's face isn't. I've hinted at it many times, but I need a better reason for why Daphne was separated from the royalness of it all other than just their parents' own stubbornness. Like what if, for example, they had this whirlwind marriage, but then the mom got offered this job on a musical tour that she just had to take with her band and she didn't regret it because she got to be a musician and she lived her dreams, but she also had a baby soon after and she knew that Henry was climbing up in his political career and she thought that it coming out that he had a baby with an American musician would ruin his career so she just stayed quiet. That would have been better for me. And then it's kept a secret from Daphne until she turned 17 and she finds it out some way and that's what compelled her to go. I'm just saying, I know that this was based on a play. That play probably sucked. So now Daphne's back at work as a waitress trying to get back into life. Table six is screaming for coffee. What are you doing anyway? Sorry, it's my college applications. Do on Monday. Oh yeah, it makes sense you wouldn't have time to worry about that where you were f***ing around in Europe for who knows how long. It's more responsible that you waited to fill those out on a serving tray while you're clocked in for your job. Right as the father-daughter dance is about to happen, Henry surprises the ladies. I'm so sorry. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change you. I wouldn't change anything about you. I wouldn't change one hair on your head. Not for anything. I love you, Dad. I love you. Hey, can you sing something, lady? We didn't hire you to stand on stage and weep at our wedding. You're not Bjork. I wish that they could have shown Henry trying to change her a little more. Like, she, he basically was like, this isn't working out. And she's like, well, I'll change to match you. But it never really felt like it was really pushed there because her changing was just condensed into that quick little montage. Would have loved to see more about that. I just think when you're groveling, it's important to bring a very large present. May I cut in? <laughs> was the large present Ian's penis? The dialogue in this is so creepy older cousin sometimes. Henry goes up and starts to apologize to Libby. You think I've waited 17 years for an apology? No ma'am, she's been waiting for that uncut royal D. She said, you better knight me with that scepter queen, Liz. Uh-oh, we hit the part of the video where I've become disgusting. Quick, get all the child actors off screen. Sometimes things aren't exactly how you always imagined. They're even better. And sometimes, like with this movie, they're a little worse. I was kind of expecting to laugh at some point, but hey, at least it's over, right? Oh, just in case you were wondering what happened to Clarissa and Glynis, they ended up exactly as they should. Found murdered and being eaten by seagulls. This movie definitely could have ended a scene before this, but hey, if they love a prologue, they're gonna love an epilogue. It's just science. As for me, I didn't end up at NYU, but before you get too disappointed, I did get into Oxford. <laughs> oh, so were you supposed to be like really smart this whole time? I never once got that she cared about school from any of this, or that she had any interests outside of missing her dad. It was my own happily ever after. Wishing on a shooting star. Wow, enough. I feel like they just shot too much happy ending footage and they were determined to use all of it. Just sell it to someone making a commercial for Crohn's disease and roll those credits. So there we have What a Girl Wants. Definitely not a great movie in my opinion, but if you are a little girl and you watch this, I can see why you wouldn't see all of those glaring holes. I'm much more excited to see another like uh, Amanda Bynes movie that I haven't seen before, like She's the Man, which seems like from the outside at least it would be a little funnier. Let me know if I'm on the right track.
track. But otherwise, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more Amanda Bynes clip breakdowns like this. Also, make sure you hit that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two whopping videos every week. So turn on notifications and you'll be the first to know when it's time for a tea party, baby. Also, I'm trying to hit 200,000 subscribers this year, so it would mean so much to me if you could jump on board the Drama Club, baby. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive bonus content like virtual watch parties and bonus episodes of Clip Breakdown. Oh, also, you guys, this will be the last video that I'm shooting on this particular background. Spoiler alert, I'm moving to Palm Springs. That's right, I got a bigger apartment in the desert because it's a better deal and I love it out in Palm Springs. And I'll have my own YouTube office where I can set up this similar looking background once again. But you should see right outside of this frame line, it's all boxes because I'm getting ready to move tomorrow. So the next time you see a video from me, you might just see a new background. All right, you guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for watching with the she's the what the girl wants with me. I will see you next time, governor.